So today, um, what we're going to do is to just forget that last week ever happened, no class, and I just moved everything down a week, and then instead of doing kind of a summary session on week eight as the first hour, I've moved the trials and witness of Paul. That's not the missionary travels of Paul, that's sort of the last stage of Paul's life as we have it recorded in Acts at least, and um, that I think I can do that fine in an hour, so I just shifted everything down a little bit, okay? Um, so. Today we are going to talk about the birth of the church, which involves the first four or five chapters of Acts. Uh, next week, persecution and expansion, which is the initiation of persecution by the Jewish authorities, and then how that, in God's miraculous plan and timing, allowed for the expansion of the church. Then Peter and the conversion of the Gentiles. You'll notice I've got Peter and the conversion of the Gentiles. Most people think, I thought Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. Peter is actually the first one to have Gentile converts. And it was Peter that God gave the vision that Gentiles too can be saved. So um, we'll deal with Peter first, because Peter, at a at fairly, you know, well, not too far on in Acts, disappears. He leaves down, and we don't really hear from him again. The next reference we have are references Paul makes to him that others make to him in his own letters. That is the, the first and second Peter. Um, and then that's where Paul kind of comes into the picture. So we'll deal with Peter and the first conversion of the Gentiles, Cornelius and his family, and then the church in Antioch. Then we'll deal with Paul and Barnabas, the missionary journeys, the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. Um, uh, then the Council of Jerusalem, which happened after the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. Then we'll talk about the outreach to the West, starting with the second missionary journey of Paul, where he crosses over from Asia to Europe, into what we know as Greece, and then the subsequent trips that Paul makes, the missionary journeys, three, and uh, you know some people call his fourth journey the uh, missionary journey, although it was actually he was in prison and he was being taken to Rome, although he preached along the way. And then um, we'll deal with the final parts of Paul there. And the final exam, I will have by week six the outline of materials for you to study for the exam, and also it's a good summary for anybody to study for the content of the class, okay? <coughs> Questions about any of that? All right, good. Um, basic summary, which we looked at last week, but I'll keep referring to the Acts of the Apostles. Um, the author, traditionally, and we hold to that traditional view, was Luke, uh, companion to Paul, the only Gentile writer of any book, that is the only non-Jewish writer of any book in our Bible. We believe it was written fairly early on, AD 62 to 69, uh, which means that Luke, who had written first the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote sort of part one and part two, and we're going to look at the start of Acts uh, in, in a minute and look at how he sort of revs it up again. You know, he, he sort of echoes in an abbreviated form the, the introduction that he did for the Gospel of Luke. Originally, the Luke and Acts, those two were combined um, and were used together, but then fairly early on in the second... The, the uh, early 3rd century, they decided that they wanted to put all four of the Gospels together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Luke, the Gospel of Luke, got separated from the book of Acts. And then after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then they added Acts. And so Acts is a critical kind of bridge between the Gospel story, because it starts out with the resurrection of Jesus and is a con con continuation of Luke, and the letters of Paul and, the, and then the Catholic letters, meaning the universal letters, the ones that are not written by Paul. So it's an important bridge, and a bridge that tells the story of the early church and its growth, and especially the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in the ministries of Peter and Paul. It historically is called the Acts of the Apostles, is the most common name, although the only apostles that get mentioned, really, other than by name, just mentioning in a list, are Peter and Paul. Um, we do have some stories of Philip, who was uh, Stephen and Philip, who were deacons. But for the most part, it does not tell us what happened to or, or what the ministry was of Thomas and various others. Uh, we have traditional stories for that, but those aren't included in here. Uh, purpose is to show that the Old Testament promises of God are being fulfilled, that Jesus was and is the Messiah, and it's shown by the miraculous way that God blesses and expands the church. And we're going to talk about today the importance of um, this sort of pivot, um, we, we talk about the, the resurrection of Jesus, and yet in terms of the history of the church, the pivotal uh, point was not the resurrection of Jesus, but the ascension of Jesus, which came uh, 40 days after his resurrection. We'll talk about that. 
One way that we can, uh, there's several ways we can outline acts. One way that's been recommended and I think is useful is the Great Commission. Jesus said, you know, go into all the world to preaching the gospel to, and he says, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Which is sort of like means start right where you are, and then the, and then the rest of this city, and then the, the area around it, and then the area beyond that, and then everywhere else. The book of Acts literally follows the growth of the church in exactly that pattern. It starts with the church in Jerusalem. From there, it moves into an expansion to Judea. With the, the, oh, that'll stop in just a minute. They're using a chain to open the door next door. So sorry about that. Um, and then into Samaria. Philip travels into Samaria, and Peter does as well a little bit. And then from there, it, it explodes and expands. So that's one way we can think about it. Um, I think I've probably shown you this map before. This is a map of the growth of the Christian church. Since, since our class is the, you know, the early Christian church in the book of Acts. This area, which is the sort of blue-green right here, okay, this area, is the expanse of the Christian church at the end of the first century, which means within 70 years of the death of Jesus. It had expanded through North, all, North Africa, all of the Middle East as we know it, what we know as Israel and Syria today, up into uh, the area, this is what we know as Turkey, it was called Asia Minor back then, heavy, um, because Paul, <coughs> the major focus of Paul, over into Greece, and then into Italy as well. Now that is within 70 years of Jesus' death. By the end of the second century, you know, uh, 170 years, the Christian church is all of this this darker area went all the way up into Gaul, uh, the, German, uh, the Germanic areas, uh, down into the Iberian Peninsula, this area Numidia of North Africa. So it's all of what was the first century plus all the rest of this. So by the end of the second century, within 170 years of Jesus' death, the Christian church had expanded to virtually all of the known world, at least all of the known world in terms of um, any Western sense. There, there was a civilization in China, there was a civilization in Mesoamerica, but everything in terms of Western history is all right here. And so within 70 years and then within 170 years, Christianity had become a dominant force throughout all of this. And that's, when you say the end of the second century, that's still 130 years before Christianity was officially legal, and it was during time of persecution, when you could be persecuted and even killed for being a Christian. And yet that's the kind of expansion we saw. The reason I'm showing you that map now is when we talk about the birth of the church, we need to have a sense of where this is going. This is where this is going in terms of the growth of the church through early history. All right? Questions about any of that? Yes? I'm not sure it's an easier, simple answer kind of question. Uh, the Jewish people didn't accept Christ. And I, I, I guess I'm wondering why that... What was the basis for them not uh, accepting Christ? Because there seemed to be the division right here at this time you're talking about. Well, many of them did. See, the early church was all Jewish Christians. It wasn't until the middle of the book of Acts, Cornelius and then the church in Antioch, the Gentiles started accepting. The reason that they didn't is first, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, we'll, we'll begin with the opposition, not the actual persecution, but the opposition. Um, the same reason that they opposed Jesus. It challenged the authority structure. It, uh, they saw it as a threat because they were afraid that Jesus and his followers would be perceived by the Romans as, um, as rebellious or uprising or that a new sect that was going to cause problems. And that when in the process of suppressing that sect, as they perceived it, the Jewish authorities perceived it, then the Jews themselves would be hurt. Uh, much of it was simply ambition. You know, they, they didn't like the fact that Jesus was calling people away from, from their authority and challenging their authority. Um, Jesus spent a good part of his time, both in Galilee and in Jerusalem, in the two areas of primary ministry, poking the religious authorities in the eye, you know, one right after the other, because they needed it. And so there are a lot of reasons. They thought it was heresy. They thought it was a false sect. And it challenged them, both politically and in terms of their personal authority. Is that why it's still the case? Well, um... Or is that a whole other question again? I don't want, I don't want to com completely deny the fact that the devil's involved here. You know, that there's, there, there are forces, spiritual forces at work to try to defame the name of Christ. I've said this over and over again, most of you have heard. One of the clients that I work most actively with is Jews for Jesus. 
in San Francisco. Well, they're all over the world, but their base is in San Francisco. And um, their whole premise, you know, their mission statement is to make the reality of Jesus as the Messiah, to make it an unavoidable reality for Jews around the world. Because they believe if you look at it with any kind of objectivity, and we're going to see that in the sermons of Paul, uh, of Peter, of Paul, of Stephen, of Philip, that they always go back to the Old Testament and say, this is what God promised. This is how all of that is fulfilled in Jesus. That's, the, that is the, that's in a nutshell, that's the ministry of Jews for Jesus and other Messianic Christian organizations. They're all Jewish people or married to Jewish people, ministering to, to Jewish people, telling them the Messiah has come. And he wants to, he, he loves you and he wants to be in a relationship with you. Let me tell you about it. Well, many Jews did become Christians. The early church, today we're going to look at, a, a, you know, the first, <coughs> sort of the birthday of the church at Pentecost was 3,000 Jews became believers in Jesus as Messiah all at one time. And then another 2,000, not too long after that, after Paul, after Peter and John healed, first really visible healing. So it's... There were political reasons, there were social reasons, there were theological reasons, but a lot of it was pride uh, initially, as it still is today. Okay? There's no better answer, I don't think, than that. Thank you. Okay? All right. Um, we're actually going to walk through, and I'm going to talk about the, the various things we deal with. You'll notice that the headings on this all are birth of the church, and then some other major aspect to it. The first piece we have, the first three verses, uh, the book of Acts, <coughs> is the prologue that Luke has written. And, and it reads, In my former book, Theophilus, now the first book, this is the, or the former book, is the Gospel of Luke, which also was dedicated to Theophilus. We don't know really who Theophilus is. Uh, the best suggestion is that he might have been a nobleman who was sort of a patron to Luke, and that he either had become a Christian but still needed more information, or he was kind of on the fence, and Luke is trying to bring him along. But here we have the second book, and Luke says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, a number of things about this. This sounds fairly simple. This is an echo of the prologue. If you go back to the Gospel of Luke, there's a sort of a longer version of this as a prologue, which sounds very clearly the same. In the, in the literary style, throughout Luke and Acts, um, nobody seriously questions the fact that this was written by the same person. Um, the, these verses probably most clearly establish the fact of the difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. You may not have noticed that when you first read it, but what Luke is saying here basically is that whereas every other religion in the world believed that they had a founder who lived and taught and established something and then died, this identifies the fact that Jesus is not dead. He came back from the dead. He gave further instructions to his followers before he then ascended. And it is still alive. And we're gonna, that, that comes out of the following verses. But these verses are critical because they declare Christianity and Jesus Christ as making a claim that no other religion has ever dared to make. That the founder is still alive. He died and came back. Okay. And that's critically important here. Um, the, it's also important to notice that this talks about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Did you notice that? Not all that Jesus did and taught, but the gospel is all that Jesus began to do and teach. The implication is that this book now, the book of Acts, is a continuation of the rest of what Jesus did and taught. That's one of the reasons that people, some people have suggested that a better name for this might be the, you know, the further acts of Jesus Christ. You know, we call it the Acts of the Apostles. Some people have said it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because in effect, what the book of Acts is, is Jesus continuing the ministry he started during his own time on earth, but doing so through the church that he established, the Twelve and the other followers, by the power of the Holy Spirit, which the Father sent at the bequest of the Son. Our creed says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
In fact, you ask about the difference in, in uh, Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity, Orthodox Christianity. One of the things that was the final straw that caused the break is that expression, and the sun. It's called filioque, which is the, Latin, the Greek for, for and the sun. And it's, um, it, it's a, that little section that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son as well as the Father was a major theological difference between East and West, and one of the final straws. But Western Christianity, we believe that the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father at the bequest of the Son because the Holy Spirit's primary job is to testify to the divinity of Jesus, the Son. And so here, um, I, I said this last week, I think, some probably the most accurate um, name for this book, rather than it being the Acts of the Apostles, because not all the Apostles are even mentioned, or the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because it's really more than that, the best name would probably be the continuing words and deeds of Jesus by His Spirit through His Apostles. Because this is about Jesus' continuing ministry, in effect, from on high, by, by the inspiration of the Spirit through His followers, the Apostles. Okay? Now, in the process here of, in this passage and the passages to come, there really are uh, four major uh, elements of equipping. There's, there's, there's a fourfold equipping that we hear about. First, we recognize that Jesus chose the apostles. Um, we see that very clearly, the apostles that he had chosen. There is a selecting process. Secondly, there is Jesus presented himself to them, that is, in, the, in his resurrected form. So there is a presentation, a showing of Jesus himself to his apostles. Um, and then, as we continue the next passages, we see the third aspect of this, the fact that he commanded them or commissioned them, he told them what they were to prepare to do, and then, fourth, he promised them the Holy Spirit. In a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So the opening passages of the book of Acts identify how Jesus prepared his disciples for the ministry to come once he was ascended. He chose them prior to this and then affirmed that choosing in his resurrection. He showed himself to them as a resurrected Savior. He commissioned them or commanded them, and then he promised them the Holy Spirit to strengthen them in that. Okay, Let's look at this next section. The birth of the church in the promise of the Holy Spirit. Um, it reads, starting with the first, fourth verse, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's that outline I talked about. You know, starting in Jerusalem where you are, and then Judea, which was the, the region around, Samaria, the next region out, and then beyond to the ends of the earth. Now, a couple of things here. Um, the, the promising of the Holy Spirit is critical to our understanding of the unfolding of Jesus' plan for the gospel. Um, I said to you a minute ago, the ascension, when, when Jesus was resurrected, he spent 40 days with the apostles. And the, during that time, we don't know exactly the particulars of what he taught them about. He spent 40 more days preparing them beyond the time he spent with them when he was alive. We do get an indication that two of the major themes, which um, he had spoken about when he was alive and focused on especially during the resurrected time, <coughs> excuse me, is the kingdom of God and the spirit of God. The kingdom of God, as we talked about in the previous class that you were in, the kingdom of God is does not mean the place where God rules. The English language kind of messes us up here because we think of a kingdom as being a location. It's an area that a king controls. The kingdom of God is intended by Jesus to be understood as the reign and authority and rule of God over all things. So when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God is, you know, is here, he meant by his own incarnation that the authority and reign and rule of God was being introduced. It was the start of the Messianic age. 
So Jesus, in his resurrected teaching, focused on the kingdom of God and the spirit of God. And in the process, he promised that the apostles would have power to manifest these realities in ministry. Charles Williams had a great statement. He said that the resurrected Jesus departed amidst scattered promises of power. Scattered promises of power, which is very true. And so the apostles are there. They receive the promise that they are going to get the Holy Spirit. They are commissioned in four ways, as I said. And, but they don't sit around. I mean, Jesus was with them for 40 days after his resurrection, before his ascension. And then there were 10 more days between Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost, which is the real focal point of early part of Acts. The second chapter of Acts is the most critical part of Scripture for understanding the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But while the apostles, having been commissioned, having been prepared for all of this, while they're waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit, which has been promised to them, as you see here, they're, they're not just sitting around. There's several things that they do. First, they have received their commission. They have witnessed the ascension. They then persevere together in committed prayer. And we read, uh, as we're going to read in a minute, that they gathered after the ascension in prayer, and they were in a time of prayer when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they did the practical business of replacing Judas Iscariot, you know, the apostle that had betrayed Jesus and then killed himself. They replaced him with Matthias. And look at that passage. Now, right in the middle of this little section, after Jesus promises them the Holy Spirit, the apostles, in verse 6, um, say to him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now remember, Israel historically believed that they were supposed to be the first nation of all the nations of the world because they were God's chosen people. When King David and King Solomon were alive, they were that great nation. Um, people, other rulers came to visit, the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon because they were famous, they were renowned, they were wealthy, they were powerful. Ever since then, there was the expectation among the Jews that they would be reestablished with that kind of geopolitical power and that the nation of Israel would become the first of all nations of the earth because they represented the God of all the earth more than any others. The whole Davidic expectation, the idea that a king of the line of David with the authority of David would return and rule over Israel and therefore rule over the world is, is much of what the messianic expectation was all about. So now, after being told the kingdom of God you know, is, is here, uh, after Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, talks to them and promises them that the Holy Spirit is coming and that they will receive power, they ask the question, so does this mean this is the time when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? John Calvin said that question has as many errors as it does words. <laughs> they have completely gotten it wrong, even now. Even after all of the time they spent with Jesus when he was alive, even after the time of teaching and the resurrected, they still haven't gotten it. And I'm sure that the resurrected Jesus must have slapped himself in, you know, in his forehead and went, Oh, you guys. And he responds, Guys, it's not for you to know about that sort of thing, for one. You know, only the Father knows. And you don't need to worry about that. The point is, you've got a job to do, and you're going to receive power with which to do it. The job I've been telling you about all along. The commission I've given you. Focus on that. The problems with that question, the reason you know, Calvin said there's many errors as words, is first, the assumption in that question is that the kingdom of God is somehow geopolitical, like the kingdom of, of David or of Solomon. Instead, Jesus has taught them, and he re reiterates, that the kingdom of God is spiritual. It means the presence of the power and authority and reign of God. The second problem with the way they ask it is they're assuming that the kingdom of God is somehow internationally limited, that it involves primarily the nation of Israel. And, in fact, it's not. It's not just Israel. It has an international membership, if you will. And third... The expectation, which Jesus confronted when he was alive, that everything was supposed to happen all at once. You know, Jesus actually got asked at one point, said, does that mean that the kingdom of God is going to happen now? Okay. Jesus, was Jesus had a real concern 
Whenever he did a healing in a Jewish area, he would tell the person he healed, this is called the hidden Messiah of Mark, he would say, don't tell anybody about this. Why did he do that? Because Jesus knew that the people were so anxious to get rid of the Romans and to reestablish Israel. They were looking for the Messiah. If they became convinced because of the miracles that Jesus was there to be that kind of Messiah, then they would have been liable to grab him and drag him to Jerusalem and put him on a throne and try to make him the king right then. And that wasn't the point, and it wasn't the time. So this whole idea that, uh, okay, is it going to happen now? Okay, now? Maybe now? It was like a, a child. Uh, you know, are we there yet? And Jesus was always fighting that, and now he's getting from this. Are you at this time going to, to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus is saying to them, this doesn't happen all at once. This is going to be a process of expansion. That's why he says, you worry about being my witnesses. That's your job. And you start here in Jerusalem. And then, when the time is right, you go out to Judea, and then Samaria, and then uttermost parts of the world. This is going to unfold itself. It's not going to happen now. And, when he says the uttermost parts of the world, or the ends of the world, as this translation has it, then that means it's not just Israel. And you guys don't worry about when it's all going to be done. You have a job to do, and I'm going to give you the power to do it. That's why I'm telling you about the Holy Spirit. So, focus on the job that you have. Don't worry about geopolitical power coming to the nation of Israel and happening right now. You're asking the wrong questions. Okay. Um, so you see, I think, how much content there is, and we just looked at the first eight verses here. Uh, G this really does establish the whole direction by Jesus' statements and the promise of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God being present, and the promise of the Holy Spirit, the whole direction for where the church is supposed to go, where the apostles are supposed to go in making this happen. Okay. Any questions about any of that? I got a question. Sure. Were the uh, uh, apostles uh, believers before they received the power of the Holy Spirit, or when that happened? They were believers in Jesus as Messiah. Yeah. Now, you ask an interesting theological question. Scripture says that we are um, not only sanctified by the Holy Spirit, which means made holy, we are justified by the Holy Spirit. In effect, theologically, what that means is that it is by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, on our behalf, He took our sins upon Himself, that, we, that it's possible for us to be saved, but it is the Holy Spirit that applies that salvation to us. So it's the act of Jesus in sacrificing himself for our sins, but then the application of that salvation to us by the Holy Spirit. Both are involved in the saving process. They were believers in Jesus Christ, but there, the completion of that salvation occurred when the Holy Spirit came upon them as the gift. And that's why the Holy Spirit is given to everyone who accepts Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is involved in the salvation of every single person. Okay. One of the things that we'll get into as we go along through this, a lot of churches confuse the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is for every Christian believer. If you did not receive the Holy Spirit, you would not be saved, because it is the Holy Spirit that, con that convicts us of that truth, convinces us of that truth, and then allows us to accept that truth in the way that provides uh, justification for ourselves and, and to allow us to be saved. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is for every Christian always. The gifts, plural, of the Holy Spirit are the particular ways in which the Holy Spirit equips individual Christians for the good of the body. Everyone who, who believes in Jesus Christ and is saved has received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit provides gifts, maybe one, maybe more, to everyone who's a believer for the good, for the common good, Paul says, for every the benefit of the body of Christ. And people confuse that. Um, there are churches, uh, charismatic churches particularly, and I'm not picking on the charismatic, because I'm not, I, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I don't think that we can read Paul and say the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not valid. All right, and I had one of my best New Testament professors ever said the gifts of the Holy Spirit were for the first century church and not for us. And I go, show me where it says that. Okay? So I believe they are for today, but I believe there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. For instance, uh, many charismatic people today believe that you have to speak in tongues in order to have the gift of the Holy Spirit. I, be I, I believe Paul is very clear that that is not true. 
that not everyone has any particular <coughs> gift, including the gifts of tongues. He mentions that in the list. Does everybody have, uh, you know, does everybody prophesy? Does, every, uh, does everybody speak in tongues? And clearly the answer is no. And yet, often in, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit does come upon people, they speak in tongues. And they've taken that to mean everybody, when they get saved, should speak in tongues, if they really have the Holy Spirit. I believe the only reason why that's the gift that is frequently, not always, but frequently manifest when somebody gets saved, is because that's the most visible of the gifts of the Spirit. When God wants it to be very clear to everybody there that the Holy Spirit is present, He uses the most visible gift of the Holy Spirit to show that He's present with them, that He's there, and that's speaking in tongues. If, if the gift that he gave people upon salvation, the, of the gifts, that is, was the gift of hospitality, it'd be kind of hard to tell, okay? Or the gift of administration, or the gift of helps. When God wants to demonstrate clearly, I am present, the Holy Spirit is present right now, he uses the most visible of all of the gifts, and I believe that's speaking in tongues. Even prophecy could be confused or misunderstood with simply expressing wisdom. Speaking in tongues is obvious, and so God uses that one as the most visible when he wants to make a point that he's present. Yes? Um, is it not that an interpreter has to be able to interpret what the, what the person speaking in tongues is saying? That's one of the things Paul says, is he says, if you're in a public setting, and here we get into the difference, and there's at least there's two kinds of speaking in tongues. We'll talk about that when we get to Acts 2. But uh, Paul says that if you're in a public setting and then don't speak in tongues. And he says that the you know um, a person has control of their own actions. Don't say, oh, the Holy Spirit took me over and I had to do this. Paul says, no, control yourself. All right? Do things decently and in order when you're in public worship. And so Paul says, before somebody speaks in tongue, there need to be somebody else who has the gift of interpretation. Or, and he says, lest somebody from outside wander in and think you're crazy, and you therefore demean the name of Christ. Um, and he says that's a, you know, it's a very personal thing, it's, it's important, but it's got to be done in an orderly way. And if you're going to speak in a tongue that nobody understands, Paul says, I would rather say five words in a, tongue, in a language somebody understands than 10,000 in a language nobody understands if there's not an interpreter present. Okay? I'm getting a little ahead of myself because we'll talk about glossolalia, the gift of tongues, a little bit later since that's the evidence that the Holy Spirit uses in the second chapter of Acts. Okay? <coughs> oh, there's so much stuff here. Um, any questions about Jesus' promise of power, promise of the Holy Spirit, but his correcting the misunderstanding that the apostles have at this point? Um, um, one more question. Yep. Did the Holy Spirit get the apostles with healing and all the other things that go with it? Yes. Okay. Now, not, now, although not everybody had all the gifts. Paul is clear about that. Not everyone has every gift. Um, there are, you know, there are people who have one gift. It may be the gift of hospitality, or the gift of administration, or the gift of teaching. Um, and there are some people who have multiple gifts. All right, the gift of preaching, the gift of, of uh, discernment, the gift of whatever. And there are lists of gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. But again, do not confuse the gift of singular of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit comes upon us to justify us by applying the salvation made available in Jesus Christ. Every Christian gets that. People who say, oh, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit, that's not biblical. I'm sorry. It's not. We had, a, we had an experience. Um, a dear, sweet, lovely lady who's no longer with us, who was part of our church, who was charismatic, she and Carolyn had you know, an ongoing thing where she would come up to Carolyn and say, Oh, Carolyn, I wish you had the Holy Spirit. And Carolyn would say, Oh, but I do have the Holy Spirit. And she said, Then you speak in tongues. And Carolyn said, No, I don't speak in tongues. <laughs> they had that same conversation. How many times would you well, guess? Three or four. Three or four, okay. <laughs> because of that, she, was of, uh, she had been taught, she was of the belief that unless you spoke in tongues, you didn't have the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, then we are not part of the body of Christ. All right? The evidence of that is we... Initially, the disciples received it, and not, not on the day of Pentecost, but before. Sure. When he breathed on them, the Holy right. Spirit, and there was no evidence of tongues or gifts or anything at that occasion. And most theologians agree that at that point, they were justified. Mm -hmm. They were saved. They were born again. Right. You know, and, and again, I'm not saying what 
almost everybody who said what I've said so far that you don't have to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit would assume I mean that this, the gifts of the Spirit are not valid because that's the next thing that usually comes out of the mouth of a theologian who says that not everybody has to speak in tongues. I do not believe that. I, I, I read, particularly in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, about the gifts of the Spirit and very clear instructions from Paul that have come down to us to help us understand the gifts of the Spirit. Why would that be in there? If it was obsolete. If it was obsolete. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. And I, I believe I've got a pretty good sense of what gifts I have. And, and speaking in tongues is not one of them. Okay? And yet I've had very dear friends that I believe did have the gift of speaking in tongues. So I am not diminishing the gifts of the Spirit. I'm saying that a lot of people have it wrong because they confuse having the gift of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit, which is given to all people who accept Jesus Christ in faith, versus the manifestation of the gifts Plural. Okay? Is that clear? Clear mm -hmm. with that? You may not agree with me, but yes? It's very clear. I, I attended a spiritual gifts inventory. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. And one lady at the end said, But, but, I've got all these gifts. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And, and it's like the woman that Charles Spurgeon, when it came to Charles Spurgeon and said, You know, Pastor, I haven't sinned in a week. <laughs> <laughs> He said, well, you must be very proud of yourself. She said, yes, I am. <laughs> I have a feeling that they, there's something in there in terms of I have all the spiritual gifts. So, yes, all right. Just, just a quick clarification. Um, I didn't ask the question if they had received perhaps all the gifts. What I wanted to know is that Jesus said that you will go and do greater deeds than I. You will heal. You will do all of these things. Right. So it's my assumption that the apostles received all the um the ability to heal and to do all of those things, which well, they did some beforehand. Of right, and, and there's a sense in which, you know, healing um, is one of the gifts of the Spirit, but um, we have to be careful here. There are, the apostles were sent out and all of them were given the special gift of preaching and teaching, and it's prophecy really, it's speaking the Word of God. <laughs> when Jesus sent out the twelve and then later sent out the seventy, he gave them the ability to speak the Word of God, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. He gave them the ability to heal, mm -hmm. which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. He gave them the ability to drive out demons. Mm -hmm. So he gave all of the apostles those. That doesn't mean they all had the gift of hospitality. In fact, it's or, or some of the other gifts that were given. And it also doesn't mean that everybody today has every one of the gifts. In fact, you get the indication that the apostles didn't necessarily have the gift of hospitality because they decided that they needed deacons to take care of that. Okay, that's why they elected the deacons. Partly because of time. You know, we don't have time. But the way that it's said, we'll get to that. Peter says, you know, we don't have time to wait on tables. Literally his words. And so we need to get some other people to do that. And that's when the deacons were elected. Mm -hmm. And the very fact that he used that kind of, like, we don't have time to wait on tables, suggests to me that Peter probably did not have the gift of hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I don't think that apostles had all of the gifts. But they had the gifts that were necessary for them to take leadership. And God had, uh, Jesus had specifically gifted them with, again, prophecy or, t or preaching or teaching, speaking the word of God, of healing and of driving out demons. Because those were the three things that Jesus ministered. And Jesus equipped them to do what he did. Mm -hmm. And do those follow through to today when he said that you will be given those gifts? Well, there are no apostles today. Are you today. able to do Okay, there are no apostles today. That does, I believe those gifts exist, but uh, we'll talk about the characteristics for an apostle. There are some new churches that have come along. In fact, one of my old professors, and a guy that I knew fairly well, he and his wife, uh, Peter Wagner, and his wife Doris. Do any of you all know Peter Wagner? See Peter Wagner? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, he was in uh, the School of World Mission in, at Fuller when I was there. Great guy. He and Doris were both great. But Peter is always on the very edge of heresy, I think. <laughs> um, and he's been part of a new movement, the Apostolic Church movement, in which they're claiming that there are apostles for today, and that he's one of them. Okay. Now, it's not as cultic as it sounds, but I think it's theologically wrong, because I don't think there are apostles for today. I think that the, character, the criteria, which are clearly stated in the book of Acts, would preclude anyone today from becoming an apostle. It was a serious question in the first century whether Paul could rightfully be called an apostle. Um, and yet, there are people today who go, 
You know that the, the, Teo, the new Teo Court building out here that was a church that was empty forever? That belongs to, I don't know the name of the church group, but uh, before I got here, before I was involved in, in Lakeside Presbyterian, they were talking to the people who owned that, and that had been a church group based in New York, and the guy who was in charge is called the Apostle, whatever it is. Okay. Um, I don't believe there are apostles today. I believe that's a mistake. Um, yeah. Um, Axe has a tendency to open up a whole can of worms. Oh, yeah. This yeah. thing, about, I, 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 for years, I, I had I embraced the idea that we had, you know, particular gifts and were inclined towards particular gifts. But the, I would like to propose that all of these gifts are resident in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And if you have the Holy Spirit through being born again and are yielded to Him, then these gifts are manifested, distributed as He wills to the one who receives it. And to that person, it becomes a gift. For me, it's really not a gift. For me, it is a gift to the person who receives the benefit of that gift. That's just something to think about. It's all resident in Him. And so when we, when, when I when I realized that, then I thought, well, there's just no stress in having to worry about what gifts I have and what I don't have. Yeah, there should never be any stress in that. And I completely agree. And what you, if people, the first statement you made, the idea that I'm inclined towards certain things, that's not, being inclined towards something is not a gift of the Spirit. Now, it may help you figure it out. I mean, if I, if, if I, there's certain things that I take joy in and that I'm good at, Mm -hmm. then that could be an indicator that that's how the Holy Spirit has, has equipped you. you know. Uh, and yet, it, you're entirely right. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are exactly that. They're of the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul tells us the gifts of the Spirit are given to whom He will according to the needs of the body for the common good. And Paul clearly says not everybody has all of them. You can have more than one, but not everybody has all of them. Okay? And they are of the Holy Spirit. It's not for me to worry about. Now, Paul says it's valid to pray for some of the gifts. He said, desire the higher gifts, especially prophecy, which means to speak the word of God. And so it's not bad to, to desire that in a, in a godly way, not in, a, you know, in an ambitious, selfish way. But, uh, but yeah, it is the Holy Spirit that decides, not us. Okay, we're never going to get through action, but I'll move on. <laughs> All right. Now, Jesus has just commissioned the uh, apostles, straightened them out in terms of their misunderstanding. The apostles really had made two mistakes. The first one was that they expected that the political power, there was going to be political power, a geopolitical kind of establishing of Israel back to his previous status, which was a very earthly kind of expectation. They expected the kingdom of God to be an earthly thing, manifest in the geopolitical power of Israel. Now we come to another place where we see that they then, they then made a mistake in the opposite direction. Let's read this passage, starting with verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white, by the way, whenever you see in the New Testament or Old Testament, that matter, two men dressed in white, that's a reference to the angelic. It's almost like a formula for angels. Two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus, by the way, in front of the Sanhedrin, he said, The Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the Father, and you will see him coming in the clouds of glory. So Jesus himself had said, in the same way that Jesus is taken into the clouds in his ascension, he will return in a similar way. The difference will be, instead of there just being a few people watching, we're told that everyone will know it. Right? It will be an unmistakable return. He's not going to return as a baby you know, in a manger in Bethlehem or something quiet. He's not going to sneak into New Jersey and then you know, <laughs> send out an email. Everybody's going to know it when he returns. Okay? Now, the, the other problem, I mentioned that one problem, the question that the, the apostles ask in verse 6 is, is now the time you're going to reestablish the kingdom of, of Israel? That's, that was believing the kingdom of God was an earthly thing. But then we've got him here standing, and the angels say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? Okay? Two things in that. One, why are you standing here? Don't you have something you're supposed to be doing? Okay, that's part of it. But the other thing is, standing here looking up into the sky. Is your focus going to be up there? Don't you have something that you're supposed to do down here right now? 
which means the danger was that their focus might be too heavenly, focusing too much on Jesus having been ascended and what's going on in heaven. The danger was always one of those two extremes. Either they would think of the, their mission as being too earthly, establishing you know, the kingdom of Israel, uh, the earthly geopolitical kingdom, or too heavenly. wonder what Jesus is doing now, you know, kind of thing. That's neither one of those is what they're supposed to be. They have a job to do. They've been commissioned, and they are going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, we believe that um, this event, the ascension, there's probably no particular aspect of the book of Acts that gets assaulted more by liberal scholars than the ascension. Particularly, they tend to say that this story of Jesus going up into the sky reflects a primitive cosmology. Primitive co cosmology means that, that throughout history, most people have thought in terms of a tripartite universe, you know, that there is the earthly plane, the heavenly plane is in the sky, and the, the demonic plane is under the ground. All right? And that's considered a very primitive cosmology, a view of the universe. And liberal scholars have said this idea that Jesus goes into heaven by going up into the sky is such a perfect example of primitive cosmology, there's no way that could really have happened. Okay? Um, but there's a problem with saying that it hasn't really happened, and that is um, five times in this short passage, Luke refers to the fact that they actually watched it happen. Okay? He says, uh, before their very eyes, a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking up intently. Why do you stand there looking into the sky? He will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Five different references here to the fact that they really did see this happen. That seems like a little bit of overkill if Luke is making this up. Okay. Um, it's also true that the whole rest of the New Testament just makes assumes it is built in that Jesus ascended in the presence of witnesses into heaven, into the skies. Now, I don't know if he got up so far and then, you know, changed dimensions to actually be in the heavenly realm with the Father to sit at his right hand. Who knows? Okay. But the point is, there's, for one thing, there's no other explanation for where Jesus went. He's no longer on earth. Where did he go? Okay, there's no other suggestion other than the fact that he ascended into heaven. And they watched him literally rise into the sky until the clouds hit. So we believe that this is both an historical event... Um, and that we'll talk a little bit later about this and the giving of the Holy Spirit are both historical, meaning it really happened. They're theological, which means it means something and it matters. And they're contemporary, which means it wasn't just for them back then, but there's something there for us now. Okay? Both the ascension and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, this act of ascension really is the pivot point for the whole um, ministry of Jesus. Because we believe that at Jesus' ascension, he ended his earthly ministry. It wasn't at his crucifixion that he ended his earthly ministry, because he came back on the third day after that and spent 40 more days with his followers, preaching and teaching and preparing them. That was still part of his earthly ministry, even though he was in a resurrected body. The earthly ministry of Jesus ended at his ascension, and at that point, the heavenly ministry of Jesus began. Because this is the start, the ascension is the start of the messianic age. The messianic age is the period of time between the ascension of Jesus and the return of Jesus, which is called the parousia. So between the ascension and the parousia is the messianic age, or you can actually think of it as the age of the Holy Spirit. Wait, would you explain that again? Parousia is, <coughs> is a Greek word for uh, second coming. The return, literally, the return. And what's the distance, the, the thing called between his ascension and his... The messianic age. Okay. okay. When, he, when Jesus was uh, crucified, uh, resurrected, and then ascended, he, as, he, he proved that he was the expected Messiah. And so the messianic age is between that and when he returns in power... At the, the second coming to issue to um, to issue in the final age, the heavenly age, when we will be in the presence of God. Okay, so at that period of time, Jesus is manifesting His will through the Holy Spirit, who is present in His in His people, the believers. 
So but this is the second half. And this is what I started with when we said Jesus began his ministry mm. in, in the Gospels. Jesus' ministry continues now. We are in the Messianic Age. This is the Age of the Holy Spirit. The time between the ascension of Jesus, the end of his earthly reign, and the return of Jesus, the parousia. Does that make sense? You guys got that? Right. <laughs> we having trouble back there? <laughs> is everything okay? Um, okay, good. Good stuff. Now, um, in effect, the angels, when they talk to the <clears throat> apostles and say, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? I believe that sort of a paraphrase of that. And when they say, the same Jesus who's been taken from you to heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven, only bigger, you know, he'll return in the clouds, in glory, but bigger, all right, with the sound of trumpets, and he will be accompanied by a multitude of both um, people and angels, the angelic hosts. Now, I think the angels, in effect, are saying, guys, he's gone. Let him go. Standing here looking up into the sky neither helps, nor is it what you're supposed to be doing right now. But remember, he'll be back. He has not deserted you. He will be back. But standing here looking up into the sky is not what you're supposed to be doing right now. Okay. Um, again, a few saw him leave. Millions and millions will see him return. This is the age of Jesus, the second half of Jesus' ministry in terms of the Messianic age. And he, he manifests it. He sits at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. He manifests his will through the Holy Spirit. We are continuing. We are his, his agents to continue his ministry in this time. Okay? Any questions about that? Just a comment. I don't think the angels would have said what they did about standing there looking into the sky if he was still, if they could still see him going. Yeah. But if he disappeared into the clouds, like it said he did, and they were sitting there wondering what's going to happen next, right? I can see why they would say that. Yeah. Well, but here, but here it says that they were looking intently up into into the sky as he was going. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, they were capturing the whole moment. So. Yeah. It's. Uh, there was a movie I watched once, and these two guys who were like from Chicago in the middle of the winter, they go to Key to Key West. And they're in Key West, and just at just evening, as the sun is setting, they're, they're walking down the sidewalk, and everybody's standing there just looking. Everybody. It's like dozens of people standing there just looking, and they're going, huh. and they say, what are you looking at? And they say, well, the sunset. Okay. And they went, what? You know, they're from Chicago, right? The sunset. You're, and so before long, they start doing it too. The idea that looking off with expectation towards something, these guys were being told by the angels, this standing, just staring off into the distance is not what you're supposed to be doing. Come on, guys, let's get with it. All right, move on. Yes? Okay. Can you just imagine you're watching somebody ascend into heaven or ascend in your very room, and then you got two angels standing next to you saying, what are you doing here? Get going. Right. I can see a, everybody making for the door. You yeah. Know? Like, well, oh, you know, this is too much. Yeah, they're out on that Mount of Olives, so there isn't actually a door. But, oh. um, but yeah. Now, they were pretty used to seeing pretty extraordinary things. You know, they saw Jesus resurrected, okay? Um, and so they, they were not unaccustomed to miraculous things, which we will talk a little bit later on about why we're unaccustomed to miraculous things. Just one thing. This, when you were talking about the, the theologians and this primitive technology, <coughs> I can just see them arrogantly wheezing out with disdain. This is just a primitive cosmology. But my thinking is, what prevents God from seeding in the heart of all humanity this what they call primitive cosmology with an understanding that there is a heaven, there is a hell. Yeah. You know, that nothing prevents that. And you, you look at scripture and see that Paul says, you know, it's pretty clear if they've seen from creation that there does exist a God. So this, this, this arrogant disdain yeah. from liberal theologians just... It's also true that, you know, that um, magic is science the first time it gets experienced, so to speak. In other words, um, it may very well be that we have all these analogies or allegories for things because it's, um, it's what we can understand and it's given to us in terms of understanding. Okay, Kenneth? I mean, just along the very lines of what he says, I mean... Ecclesiastic said, God's put eternity in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. no matter who you are, God's put it in there. Okay. Let's keep going. 
All right, so Jesus has ascended into heaven. The apostles have been told, get with it. This is what happens next in the next 10 days between the ascension and the day of Pentecost. We read, starting with verse 12, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath stay walk from the city. A Sabbath stay walk, there was a restriction in the law as to how far you could walk. It was basically about um, three quarters of a kilometer, you know, something like that, uh, 1,100 meters. Mm -hmm. you know. That's how far you could walk on the Sabbath, because you weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath, and they thought you could walk that far without it really being work. About a 15-minute walk, which meant that the ascension happened someplace close enough to uh, the city that they could walk back into Jerusalem from where they were on the Mount of Olives without violating the Sabbath restrictions. Okay? Um, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. We don't have any details about which room that was. Some people said maybe it was the same as the upper room, or maybe, you know, we don't know. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. And I cut these verses out because I can't get everything, but then... Um, Peter goes on to quote two passages from the Old Testament about, um, well, let's see, did I cut those out? Uh, no, I've got those two here. Sorry, there's another place I cut out two, some, some references. Now, let me give you a little bit of this, and then we're going to take a break. Um, you will notice that they are constantly in prayer. This is the list of the apostles, minus Judas Iscariot. We're also told that they were joined by the women. There were several women, we're told elsewhere in the Gospels, that provided for were well off enough that they provided for the, Jesus and the Apostle, particularly Mary Magdalene. Joanna, whose husband was the, the, uh, in charge of Herod's household, so he was, a, he was the house manager for Herod, and Susanna, those were probably the women referred to. Mary, the mother of Jesus, this is the last reference we have in the New Testament to Mary, the last presence that, that we have. I mean, she's referred to by name, but the last time we have an indication of her being present anywhere. And with his brothers, these are the brothers of Jesus, who apparently had experience, we're told particularly that James, James, the brother of Jesus, experienced the resurrected Christ and believed that he truly was the Messiah. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, he's called James the Just, he later on became the head of the Jerusalem Council and so sort of the senior elder of the church at that time. Um, it's interesting when it says, in those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120 we know there were more believers than that because at one point we're told that 500 people witnessed the resurrected Jesus. So this means there were about 120 of them gathered together in Jerusalem. So it was a pretty big room. That number is considered to be important because in the Jewish law, if you had 120 people, you could declare yourself to be a community and you could have your own council. Right? So 120 people was an important number for, for the Jewish expectation. And they established the fact that Judas, Judas Iscariot, and again, you'll notice there, there actually is um, um, a Judas son of James who elsewhere is called Thaddeus. They later call, start calling him Thaddeus because probably they didn't want to associate anybody with the name Judas after that. And people had multiple names. Um, and Judas Iscariot, who died, and the, the, the detail of the fact that he took the silver that he got for betrayal, he bought a field, which is called the Field of Blood, and it says that he uh, fell headlong into that field and his guts spilled out. Elsewhere, we're told he hanged himself. And so the best, the best idea is that he probably hanged himself on, from a tree in that field. And then after a time, his, you know, as his body started decomposing, uh, the, he f fell from that rope, fell into the field, and his guts spilled out. So those two stories are not contrary to one another. It's possible they're both true. That's the part we skipped. Okay, we're going to take a break right now. Up to the 20th verse of the first chapter. And let me read this and talk about it for a minute. For, said Peter, and again, remember, he has just said that we need to replace Judas. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. That's from Psalm 69. 
and may another take his place of leadership, Psalm 109. Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. Okay, several things about this. <clears throat> One, the real strong emphasis on replacing Judas so that they have 12. There's a reason for that. I mean, not only so that they have 12 people. Uh, the idea is that Jesus 12 chose 12 for a reason, and that 12 people was the right number. But particularly, there's recognition throughout the New Testament, uh, and historically as well, that the number 12 had very special significance to the Jewish people. Uh, the, the fact that there were 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob had uh, Israel, Jacob Israel had 12 sons, each of whom fathered a tribe. It actually ended up, you know, with Joseph having two. I won't get into that. But anyway, the 12 tribes of Israel were considered the representation of God's old covenant with Israel. In the same way as Jesus introduced the new covenant that would be open not only to Israel but to everyone, the number 12 was important as the 12 apostles. As a clear echo, whenever a Jew in the time of Jesus would hear that Jesus had 12 apostles, that immediately would resonate with them in terms of being a reflection of the 12 tribes of Israel and the representation of the covenant with God. So that's the reason why, because Judas was a betrayer and the ministry has just started, the feeling was he needed to be replaced. Now later on, the first martyr of the apostles, James, the, the brother of John, was the first martyr. He's beheaded uh, fairly early on, in fact. They don't replace him because he was loyal up to his death. And by that time, the Holy Spirit had been given, the church had begun, uh, had been planted, Pentecost was passed, and so there was not any need to replace him. But at this point, and in order to establish the start of the church, 12 was needed. They establish a very clear criteria here, um, and that is that really there's two criteria wrapped up in these passages, verses 21 and following. First, the person had to be there for the whole ministry of Jesus, present with them as part of their group, from the time of John the Baptist, and that is, the time of John the Baptist means the baptism of Jesus, the very start of his ministry, all the way through to the ascension, when Jesus was taken up from us. And they had to be able to, to witness to the resurrected Christ. They had to become a witness with the others of the resurrection. <clears throat> now those two criteria, a witness to the resurrection, and they had to be there the whole time, um, limited their options. In fact, there are some scholars down through the years who have said they shouldn't have elected Matthias because Paul was coming and Paul was going to be an apostle and he would be the twelfth. But you know what? While we believe Paul was an apostle, he was uniquely, he did experience the resurrected Christ, a very special commission, as Paul said, by special arrangement. <coughs> Jesus appeared to him um, on the road to Damascus and Paul received special training, even to the sense of having a vision of being elevated to the heavens in order to understand. But for all of that, he had not been with Jesus from during Jesus' ministry. And so in that regard, he would not qualify for being elected to one of the twelve. That doesn't mean he would not be an apostle. There are actually other people who are identified as apostles. Uh, James the Just, Jesus' brother, is called an apostle in one place. Um, uh, Barnabas, who will appear a little bit later, was identified as an apostle. There's even one woman who's referred to as an apostle. And so, being an apostle was different than being one of the twelve apostles, which were the core that, uh, of leadership. So, that's the difference here. So they nominate two people, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. I wonder if he had a nickname. <laughs> uh, um, Just a quick question, why do they have so many names, like Joseph and Barnabas? Well, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. Justice is a, a Latin name. It's a Roman name. And so they're growing up in the time, Roman time, people frequently would have a, a Roman name. Barsabbas is, um, and Joseph, 
Joseph is a Hebrew name, you know, Joseph from the Old Testament. Or Sabbath may be Aramaic, I'm not sure. But again, people spoke multiple languages. And so, um, you know... William Bill Guillermo. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, Ross Donnelly Arnold. Or, you know, the, I know people who have four or five names because their parents were, you know, overly yes. energetic uh, when they were born. <laughs> and, and that's sort of what we get here. Uh, there had, you know, his, his, his friends who spoke Latin called him Justice. His friends who spoke Hebrew called him Joseph. Barsabbas may have been his, you know, his, soror his fraternity name. I don't know. But you get the idea. There are a lot of, a lot of things. In my family, everybody has a nickname. Everybody. I'm Rusty, believe it or not. No red hair, no nothing. My brother, Perry, is Buddy. My brother, Charles, is Jack. Um, you know, it's just that that's a Southern thing. But it also is a Hebrew thing. So anyway. Um, so the process they go through is very important here. These two men, Joseph, Barsabbas, Justice, and Matthias, Eusebius, one of the church historians, the most important of the church historians, said that very early on, that these two men, um, Justice and Matthias, were both, uh, they were two of the 70 that Jesus sent out. You will remember that Jesus in the Gospels, he, he sent the 12 out and commissioned them first, to preach and heal and drive out demons. Later on, he sent out 70 of his followers and specially commissioned them. Well, according to Eusebius, which is not scripture, but he's, he's a trusted historian, these two men were both part of the 70. So they had been anointed, they had been part of the body. After considering and praying about who are, you know, who are the best candidates, the guys pick two. The, that is, the, the, the body picks two. And then they pray, Lord, you know everyone's heart, show us which of these two you have chosen. That's very important. The apostles believed that uh, Jesus had chosen the original twelve. He made the choice. He called them to himself and said, you will be my twelve apostles, meaning the ones sent out. Now they're saying, since we have to replace Judas and Jesus isn't actually here physically, but he's still available to us and we want him to make that choice. So they use their best judgment and pick two and then they cast lots. Literally like casting dice, basically, to decide which of those two. And in that, it's not that they were gambling or that they were giving up or that they didn't really care. Quite the contrary. They really did this because they wanted uh, God, Jesus especially, to be the one who made the final choice. And by prayerfully and faithfully casting lots between these two, Justice and Matthias, then they feel like by choosing Matthias, that was God's choice. Okay. Um, they were not being irresponsible about it. They prayed about it, they thought about it, they considered you know, who was a candidate, they considered who were the best candidates. The final decision between the last two they left to God. Okay. Um, questions about that? Whatever happened to Matthias? We, we have no further, his name is never mentioned again. So we don't know. There, are, I'm sure there's some traditions associated with it, which I don't know off the top of my head. <coughs> but we don't know anything about it beyond that. All right, now, now we get to the, the real crux point. Uh, chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, a couple things about this. One, the day of Pentecost. Most Christians think the day of Pentecost was the day the Holy Spirit came, and they have no concept that it was before that. The day of Pentecost was a festival celebration of the Jewish people before this happened. Um, Passover, you will remember Passover, which is when we celebrate Easter, because that's when Jesus celebrated Passover with his followers and then was crucified, died, buried, resurrected. Um, Passover, 50 days after Passover, was Pentecost. You will remember in, in the Exodus from Egypt, Passover was when, the, when death passed over the houses of the Israelites. That's why it's called Passover. He took the, the, death took the firstborn of all of the Egyptians, but not the Israelites because they had the blood of the sacrificed lamb on the uh, doorpost and lintel of their house. So at, that was the night when the Israelites left Egypt, you know, or took off from Egypt. 
50 days later, they arrived at Mount Sinai. Right? So, Passover, 50 days later, Pentecost. Pentecost, especially during the time of the uh, intertestamental period, became a celebration of the giving of the law at Sinai, 50 days after Passover. It was also, you, you may have heard in your, you know, if you've had Sunday school classes and stuff of the various festivals, it was also called the Feast of Harvests or the Feast of Weeks. That's what, past, what, that's what Pentecost was, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of uh, Harvest, and the celebration of the giving of the law. It was a major festival for the Jews, which is important because we're going to see in just a minute here, there were Jews from everywhere in Jerusalem for this major festival. Remember, the law was the, the backbone of the Jewish people. That was the thing that held them together as a people, no matter where they went. And so the celebration of the giving of the law was, was fundamental, and it was a major uh, event. Now, um, <clears throat> at this point, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, there, other than the actual sacrificial act of Jesus, there is no more important moment in the history of the Christian church than this one. Because without the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, I mean, God could have given him some other time too, but the giving of the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, there would be no life giver. I mean, there would be no justification, much less sanctification. There would be no Christian discipleship. There would be no understanding of God's will for us. There would be no fellowship amongst Christians, no unity, no Christ-like character, no ability to witness. I say that because all of those things are things we're told us the Holy Spirit is responsible for. So the coming of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus had said, was the fundamental thing that gave Christians, the, the early church and, and the church today, and everywhere in between, the ability to fulfill the commission that we have been given to share the love and grace and knowledge of Jesus. That's how important this was. Now Luke, both in the Gospel of Luke and obviously here in Acts, but in the Gospel of Luke, Luke emphasizes the Holy Spirit more than any of the four uh, any of the other three gospel writers, they all emphasize the importance of the Holy Spirit. But Luke has a special passion for this, and that passion carries over not only Luke's gospel but here into the Book of Acts. Um, and a couple of things that we need to understand about the giving of the Holy Spirit. I think we need to see the gift of the Holy Spirit at this moment as Jesus's final act of his saving ministry before his return. In other words, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, we are told. In Jesus' own words, he said that was the case. He is, eventually he will return. The giving of the Holy Spirit was the thing that really launched, I mean, I talked about his ascension, then ten days later the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit fulfilled, or really launched the Messianic era, which I said could also be considered the era of the Holy Spirit. And in, as such, it sort of was the final act of Jesus' saving ministry. As I said earlier, we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. But that grace is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. The justification that comes by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is involved in giving us the grace that came through the merciful act of Jesus. So that's one thing. This is Jesus' final act of salvation of his saving ministry before his return. Secondly, the Pentecostal act or Pentecost gave the apostles <clears throat> what they needed. This is the equipping moment for the apostles to fulfill their, their mission and ministry. Pentecost also, as I said, inaugurates the new era of the Holy Spirit, the Messianic era. And, in many ways, we could say that this is the first revival that the church ever had. Because if you think of a revival as an awareness of a visitation by God, a revived awareness and a turning to God, this is the first one. This is the place where that idea of Christian revival happened. Um, it's also interesting to note here that um, God utilizes multiple senses of the apostles when this happens. For instance, we're, it's not like the Holy Spirit came upon them when they spoke in tongues. They heard a sound like a violent wind, so it affected their hearing. They saw what appeared to be like tongues of flame landing on everyone, so their sight was involved. And then they spoke in other tongues. It's been observed that you might say that hearing the sound of a violent wind is the demonstration of power. Seeing the tongues of fire is a demonstration of purity. You know, fire is a symbol of purity. 
and speaking in other tongues, many other tongues, is a sign of the universal witness that the Holy Spirit made possible. <coughs> this is the crux point in the Church of Jesus Christ. In many ways, this is the birthday of, Jesus, of uh, the Church. This is when the Church began, truly. Doesn't mean, you know, some people could say, well, the Church began with the call of Abraham. Because the preparation for the time of Jesus began with the call of Abraham. There's some truth to that. You could also say the church began when Jesus called his first followers, because those were the that was the foundation for the future church. But the place in which the church really starts in terms of having the the responsibility to witness and minister the truth of Jesus Christ is when the Holy Spirit comes. And this is a critical time. Now, why the speaking in other tongues? What's that all about? Well, you remember I said I believe the reason why. Whenever God wants to make a real point of demonstrating His presence, speaking in tongues is the most obvious of the gifts. Well, there's a particular reason why they spoke in other tongues. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 5. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Now that's a little exaggeration. There was China, there was Mesoamerica. But Luke is speaking from his perspective. And he's saying that virtually the whole known world... There were Jews from the diaspora. Diaspora is a word that means spreading out. There were several instances in Jewish history in which the Jews were either taken into exile or for various other reasons spread out so that you had Jewish communities in virtually the whole known Western world. Okay? So, Luke's words are from every nation under heaven. Pretty much the whole known world. When they heard this sound, the apostles and others speaking in tongues, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard his own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they had too much wine. I love that little statement because it interjects, there's, there's a, a reality in that. You know, there's a veracity, a truthfulness when they record that some people were making fun of them. Now, that wasn't a serious accusation. They were making fun of them, trying to sort of explain what's going on. This list, which I think I have, yeah, this list of different places that the Jews had come from is indicative of the fact that the Jews were spread out all over. Um, they were throughout the known world. Now, um, in, in fact, this, I've got two maps here. This one will give you an idea. These yellow highlighted areas, all the way from Rome through various parts of Asia Minor, North Africa, Libya and Cyrene, Egypt, Arabia, Judah, of course, because Jerusalem's right here, um, Elam, uh, Medea, Parthia, Mesopotamia, they talk about the Parthian regions over here, uh, Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, Pamphylia, Phrygia, Asia, simpler way to look at it. They came from everywhere. There are Jews from all over. This is the, you know, the eastern Mediterranean here, this Mediterranean Sea. This is North Africa and Egypt, the Middle East, Arabia. This is what today we would know of as Iraq and Iran, uh, up into Turkey, um, all the way over into Rome. Okay? They're coming from everywhere. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about glossolalia. In fact, I'm going to back up so that you can look at the passage. Let's go that way. Glossolalia is the technical term for speaking in tongues. And there's several things first we have to recognize that it wasn't and then what it was. First, it was not drunkenness. You know, Peter makes a comment about that. Guys, guys it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Come on, they're not drunk. All right? I mean, uh, and it was just a joke when somebody said that to try to explain it. So it wasn't drunkenness. It was not a mistake, or and this is, a, this is uh, because in one place here it says everyone heard their own language being spoken. They think, well, it was a miracle of hearing. Before it says they heard their own language being spoken, we're told 
that the disciples and apostles were speaking in other tongues. So it's not that the miracle was that their ears were made different. It's that they actually were speaking in other tongues. It's also not incoherent babbling, which some, some people have tried to claim, that they're just jabbering and everybody, and, and Luke, who maybe didn't understand all those languages, assumed they were speaking in meaningful languages. No, we're told that the people understood. And not only did they understand, but we're about to see that it affected them very, very deeply, what they, what they experienced. So we believe that this event, glossolalia, speaking in other tongues, was a supernatural event that the apostles really were given. I say apostles, there were more than just the 12 there, the disciples. They were given a supernatural ability to speak in other tongues, and in this case, this is a supernatural ability to speak in languages that, that are real languages that other people speak and understand. Okay. Now, again, I want to differentiate the gift of the Holy Spirit, which happens here, is demonstrated by this because God wants to make it evident to everybody there that He is present and that something miraculous and supernatural is going on. This gift of the Holy Spirit, even though there's a, there's a speaking in tongues here, is not the same as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in fact, there are differences between this experience of glossolalia, this speaking in tongues, and the kind of speaking in tongues which Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 especially, and that's referred to elsewhere as well. Um, particularly, this event of speaking in tongues has a different direction. This speaking in tongues was directed outward toward people to he so that these people would hear it and be stopped in their tracks and say, what's going on here? So that they would listen to the message. The speaking in tongues in Corinthian, 1 Corinthians and elsewhere is, is directed toward God. It is a prayer language. In fact, that's an expression that charismatic, uh, charismatics often use, that it is a prayer language. It may be used in a public setting. It may be, if there's an interpreter, or there may be some aspect of it that's edifying, but it is not used to witness to people who don't yet know uh, Jesus. This, one, this time they did. So there's a difference in direction. There's a difference in nature, uh, the, the, the character of it. This is intelligible languages. The usual speaking in tongues that's referred to in 1 Corinthians is not intelligible unless you have an interpreter. So it is not represented as being, you know, uh, Arabic or of being uh, Elamite or some other language that these people were hearing. It's also different in purpose. This was intended as witness. The, the speaking in tongues in 1 Corinthians is intended as a praise. Okay. Um, and this was a unique kind of, this, the way this happened, it only happened once. Whereas Paul says that speaking in tongues is a continuing gift of the Spirit that people can have. So there are differences between this event and the speaking in tongues that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. And it's referred to, for instance, you know, when, um, when the first Gentiles become Christians and they, and they speak in tongues, then everybody, the, the people who were there say, well, apparently God's present here, so who are we to say this is a bad idea? Okay. Because God wants, that, wants it to be evident that he's at work, at work there. All right? Now... Um, the, the other significance of speaking in all of these different languages with all these different people there, which I will go back to this map because it's easier to see, this is in one way answering the apostles' question to Jesus, which he, he sort of had to correct them on, where they said, is now the time when the kingdom of Israel is going to be established? thinking that this was something for our country, for our nation, a geopolitical thing. By this being the first act, great act of witness when the Holy Spirit came upon the people, and having people from all over, now these are all Jews at this point. They are Jews that have been spread out because of the various exiles and diasporas of the Jewish people. But this whole act emphasizes the universality of the gospel message. It is a statement very clear to all of these different people hearing the gospel truth in their own language from so many different places that the gospel is for everyone. This message is for everyone. It's not just for the people living in Jerusalem or in Judea or Samaria, but from everywhere. It's also true in a fascinating kind of way that um, this is a reversal of the curse of Babel. Right? One of the things that happens in the first 11 chapters, there are four great events in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. One of them is the Tower of Babel event, in which, out of pride, the people of Babel say that we're going to build a tower up to the heavens, because we're as great as, you know, as God is, basically. 
And God says, well, if they're able to do this, then they could do anything. And I need to, I need to show them that they're not the greatest power in the world. And so he confuses their language. So in the same way that, that the, the Tower of Babel was an attempt by pride to ascend to heaven, here we have everyone being able to understand languages that are being spoken at the same time. And, and, and exactly counter to Babel, this is an example of the humility of God coming down to earth. Not the pride of people trying to rise up to heaven at the Tower of Babel, but the humility of Jesus who's willing to be treated the way he was and betrayed and beaten and, and sacrificed, now being manifest by the presence of the Holy Spirit that his, his ministry and gospel message will be shared. It's the humility of God being come down to earth in a very practical way. So there's, there's kind of a beautiful kind of counter parallel there. Okay? Questions about that? Have you heard any uh, his, history about <coughs> this particular type of manifestation has occurred since then? Not, I, I think this is the only time. This initial gift of the Holy Spirit is the only time that I'm aware of that this has ever happened. Now, um, it is interesting that the, because all of these people come from all these places to Jerusalem, visiting because of the festival of Pentecost, festival of harvest of weeks, they hear the message, as you're going to see in just a second, 3,000 of them get saved. And after they're saved and they're baptized, they go back home. Well, what happens when they go back home? To Rome and Pontus and Cappadocia and Pamphylia and Libya and Cyrene and Arabia and Elam and Medea. What happens? They take their new faith with them. And this is one of the first ways in which the truth of the gospel gets carried out to the ends of the earth. Another way that we're going to be studying probably next week in the first persecution that happens from the Jewish authorities against the early Christians after the stoning of Stephen is, and it's particularly the, um, the Greek Jews, that is the Hellenized Jews, not the Hebraic Jews, and I'll describe that difference next week. There's a persecution that starts against the Hellenized Jews, and a lot of them flee Jerusalem because of the persecution. They run off. You remember that um, the Apostle Paul, who was then called Saul, was on his way to Damascus, in Syria to try to capture some of these Jews who were believers in Jesus who had left Jerusalem to capture them, bring them back, you know, under arrest and try them. So they had fled. Well, what happened when these Christian, those Jewish Christians, um, fled persecution in Jerusalem and went to all these different places? They took their faith with them. And that's why later on, without us having any direct stories about it, that's why you get people like um, Apollo coming from Alexandria, and he's already a Christian. How did the message get to Alexandria? Well, either from one of these, either, either this event or the persecution after Stephen. We get um, uh, Aquila and Priscilla coming from Rome. Well, this is before Peter or Paul or anybody else went to Rome in terms of any of the major apostles. How did the message get to Rome? How was it that there was a Christian community in Rome that Priscilla and Aquila were part of? Well, because either here at this time, because you'll see that up in the upper left-hand corner of Rome, or uh, after the persecution, the stoning of Stephen, people went to Rome and they carried the message with them. And in every one of those places, this is why those maps that I showed you early on, when you see the spread of the Christian church in the first century and then by the end of the second century, some of it was because of persecution. And some of it was because of miraculous events that God orchestrated in order to have people drawn together to receive the message and then go back to their homes and take the truth with them. Okay? Question about that? Yes? I don't really have a question about that. I just have something that's, I don't know, bothering me, so I have to say it. Okay. Um, do you not think it's really important that this happened at Pentecost? Because at, they're celebrating the receiving of the, the word, the laws, the, the right. words, what binds us together, what we are, what we believe in. And now we're getting another message and we all understand this message and we're all uh, amazed by this message right it's and it's on the same day right the, you know only many years later of course. yeah and you could draw a parallel again from the time of Moses Moses even said that you know um, God will send another prophet and it's a, a clear messianic kind of representation um, the fulfillment of the law the completion of the law if you will 
which is represented by this act of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to, to manifest the, the truth of the grace of Jesus Christ to the whole world and for it to spread out. Um, you know, more people got saved on the day of Pentecost, as you're going to see in just a second, than the whole time Jesus was in ministry for three years. There were more people saved than that, one, and, you know, within a couple hours, because of Peter's sermon, you know, you talk, somebody quoted earlier, Jesus said, greater things than I do, you will do. Well, here it is. 3,000 people get saved at one time. Jesus never had that many people who were followers of his when he was on, on earth. And it wasn't because he wasn't up to it, it's because he was preparing for this, okay? And so, yes, this is the fulfillment of the law, it's the completion of the law. You can draw a lot of theological parallels between the day of Pentecost, the celebration of the giving of the law, being the day in which the Holy Spirit came to establish the, the new covenant to complete or fulfill the law. But there's a lot we can do with that. Okay? Let's keep going. 